Hi, welcome to Mansfield Public Schools information session regarding health services, transportation, and food services. I'm Christine Dooling, Director of Health Services, and I have with me Ed Donahue. He's Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operation, and Don Linktree, Director of Food Services. Um, I am just going to get started because we have a lot of information to give you, um, and we're going to start with health services. So um, you can just fast forward a page. Um, the agenda tonight, we're going to cover some information on our COVID-19 data update that we added to our website. We're going to talk about mask wearing, what students can wear, review the symptom checklist and what parents should do and guardians should do when a student is sick, All right. talk about communication from the nurses, isolation and quarantine, review what contact tracing is going to look like in the school, um, view our return to school flow sheet, talk about the stu student travel mandate, the flu vaccine mandate, and um, some changes to the health office, including screening. So we do have a lot of information for you. Um, this was just added to our website, um, I think yesterday, it was today, I don't know, maybe two days ago. So this is our new pub Mansfield Public Schools COVID-19 update graph. It will be updated on Mondays and we're going to tally the number of cases we have under isolation, student and staff total, together and then um, a total since the beginning of school and the total number of contacts that are under quarantine and then the total of number of people who have been under um, quarantine since the beginning of school. So we picked September 1st, the first day that our teachers um, came back to our school and we are continuing to count even while we're in remote. And again, that will be updated on Monday. Um, so masks. We've had a lot of discussions about masks, what can be worn, what can't be worn. We're following the CDC and the DPH guidelines. Any mask that um, covers the mouth and the chin, um, students are able to wear. They usually loop around the ears, but gaiters are also um, allowed in the schools as long as it covers the nose and sits below the chin. What students can't wear is on the next slide. They can't wear bandanas or masks with vents. This allows too much exhaled air to escape into the environment. So bandanas and masks with vents are not allowed in the schools currently. Um, this is the student checklist that was mailed home with the beginning of school packets. It's also on our Return to Learning um, website and it can be printed out. This is something that we want students to review with their parents or guardians on a daily basis or even for older <laughs> students just to review in their head how they're feeling. It's going to be a Difficult year with coming to school and we're really gonna have to stay home when we're sick. Think about how we're feeling when we wake up in the morning and um, stay home and see how we feel. The questions on the bottom under section two, have you had close contact with anybody with a confirmed case of COVID-19 or if you've traveled to a place where there's high rate of COVID-19? Anytime those are answered yes, you need to stay home and you need to call a physician. For the symptoms, there's some symptoms that are standalone that you can just see how you feel as the day goes on. And if you feel better, you can come to school the next day, say like an isolated headache, an isolated stomach ache. Um, there are other symptoms that will always require a call to the physician. If you click to the next slide, when to stay home. So um, when you're staying home and you're not feeling well, you're thinking about how you feel, you're seeing if you recover. There's, um, for parents and guardians, there always comes a, a point in the day when the child isn't recovering or something switches and you're a little bit concerned about the symptoms, and that's when you call a physician. Um, you should always call a physician if there's a fever, a cough and congestion, or if there's multiple symptoms, including muscle aches, diarrhea, and headache. When you call a physician, um, we will listen to the guidance of the physician. If they know that there's an underlying condition that your student or you have, and they think this is related to that, and they tell you to stay home, and they're willing to write a note, and you can return to school, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you call a physician with multiple symptoms, at this point and where we're at in the pandemic, um, most physicians would give you advice and they would probably refer you for a COVID test as well. Um, there's a lot of COVID test testing going on right now because there's always the possibility of a co-infection and no one wants to miss that. So if you, let's just say the doctor thinks it's an airache, puts you on antibiotics, puts the student on antibiotics, but also orders a COVID test. As soon as that COVID test comes back negative, um, your student can come back to school per, per the regular routine, return to school guidelines, which would be fever-free for 24 hours and an improvement in symptoms. 
Um, again, if there's a mild symptoms like an isolated stuffy nose, an isolated headache, feeling really tired, they're better by the um, end of the day, they can come back to school the next time that they're scheduled to come to school and that does not require a call to the physician. But anything with a fever, it does require a call to the physician. So that leads us to what's, what it's gonna be look like in school and um, what communication you're going to get from the school nurse. Um, our dismissal for, our level for dismissal this year is gonna be a little bit different than it has been in the past. There's not gonna be that type of thing where we send the student back and see how they feel. We're really gonna dismiss with sick symptoms. Um, again, but when we dismiss during the day, that doesn't necessarily mean a call to the doctor. We wanna dismiss somebody during the day with mild symptoms, if those symptoms continue to be mild or the person feels better the next day, then that's great. But if those symptoms progress, we don't want them to be in the school when that is happening. Um, anything with fever, multiple sim symptoms, respiratory symptoms, again, that requires a call to the doctor and a medical note for return. Um, other reasons that the school nurses might be calling you, um, we're really going to try to communicate with our administrative assistants this year if they get information about why you're out. But if we see that somebody's out for extended time, we'll be calling about that. Um, if we know you're having upcoming travel plans, we'll call you about that. And we're going to talk about that in a later slide. Um, we'll be calling people to get some flu vaccine information, which will be coming up in a later slide, and also contact tracing. Um, the high school has set up, uh, oh, if you just click back for one second, the high school has set up an email for their attendance. So you can directly email that line and put any information that we might need to know in that um, email and always include whether the, you've been in touch with anybody who has had a positive um, COVID test. Um, now I'm gonna get into some information that is about um, positive cases and contacts and contact tracing. So. Um, what is, a what is a positive case? That's when somebody tests positive for COVID-19. Pretty much we know what that is. A contact, once somebody turns positive, then the um, conversation goes around to what have been your close contacts. Close contacts are the people that need to quarantine. So when you're a case, a positive case, you need to isolate. And when you're a contact of somebody who's a case, you need to quarantine. They're slightly different, but they both require you to stay home. The big question that we have is, some questions like, um, my son's best friend is a contact. Does my son have to quarantine? Um, I went to dinner with my friend and she just called me. She's a contact of a case. Do I have to contact quarantine? No. If you're a contact of a contact, you just live your life how you've been doing. You do all your safe um, precautions that you're doing, wear your mask, wash your hands, do safe social distancing, and you just continue on your way. We're finding that um, sometimes when people are in certain situations and they're wearing their mask and they're practicing social distancing, the contacts don't become positive. They just quarantine for 14 days. Um, so it's an extra step to worry about contacts of a contacts. All we worry about are cases and contacts. If contacts turn positive, then that's when the investigation goes on. Um, so you have a positive test for COVID-19. Um, and you have to isolate. Isolate means that you have to stay in your house for 10 days. Um, 10 days is the average length of the illness. Studies have shown that um, after 10 days, when you have an improvement in symptoms and no fever for 24 hours, you're not shedding the symptoms on to, symptom, I mean, virus onto other people. So that is the length of the isolation. So when you're isolating in your house, you need to keep to your own space. If you can keep to your own bedroom, sleep in your own bed, try to use um, a separate bathroom or wipe your bathroom down after every usage, eat by yourself. If you need to get something in the house, wear your mask when you're passing other individuals. Um, close contacts. So now we have a positive case and we need to find out who the contacts are. So in the schools, what we're thinking a close contact is, is somebody who has been within six feet of a positive individual for at least 15 minutes, whether it's a classroom, bus, another school space, while the person was infectious or two days prior to the symptoms. So a person is um, infectious the first day of their symptoms, plus 48 hours prior, or sometimes we find out if somebody's positive just because they have a test for a certain reason. So the day of the positive test, we always dial back 48 hours. Um, in the elementary, in the middle school, what we're going to consider close contacts um, at this beginning of school as we start this is the classroom that they're assigned to. So their cohort or their classroom group. So that would be like cohort A or cohort B, whoever they're in school with at JJ and Robinson. And at the middle school, um, 
it would be the platoon within the team that they're um, assigned to. So at JJ and Robinson, the numbers might look like, I'm not really sure how many people are in a a cohort, but um, those are the people that we would be quarantining. Um, At the high school, we would be interviewing the um, specific positive case and be looking for information about what their day looked like. We would also be um, at every school, we would be looking at class lists, class seatings, um, we would be talking to teachers and paras. We will be looking at recess and we'll be looking at lunch because there's probably certain situations that there's going to be some interaction that we might want to get ahead of. Um, examples of close contacts. Um, always the people that you live with are your, cl- your close contacts. Um, teachers and students in the same cohort are close contacts. Um, when we start this investigation, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, some of the questions that we'll ask will lead to some things that are be doing outside of school and, you know, friends, uh, students who have friends that they socialize outside of school without masks, that's a close contact. In the school, examples that are not close contacts are people that we interact with in passing. So if you are going through the cafeteria line and you're purchasing food, the uh, employee who works at the cash register and the student who is going through the line, those are not close contacts. They're masks and it's a brief interlude. Somebody holds the door open for somebody else, that's not a close contact. Maybe you're waiting to go into an office and you see somebody in there, they pass you, that's not a close contact. So um, those are the questions that are gonna come up when we have cases in the school and the nurses will be happy to answer um, you know, any question that you have. So when you are deemed a close contact, what does that mean? So close contact has to quarantine. So quarantine is actually longer than isolation. A quarantine is 14 days. It's pretty much the same thing, not quite as strict, but you have to stay in your own house. Um, Because we don't know when you're gonna turn positive, the incubation period of this um, virus is two to 14 days. So although you might be feeling great at the beginning of the quarantine and you don't have any symptoms, you should really get into a habit of kind of keeping yourself apart and um, keeping your own space in case you were to um, turn turn positive during the time and you don't want to infect your family members. So um, kind of keep to your own space, same same other things. Try to use your own bathroom, wipe it down after you use it, um, eat on your own. Um, You can interact with your family, but try to keep your interaction, you know, below five to seven minutes. So you just stay below that that length of the 15 minutes. Um, And no matter what happens with testing, a a person who is quarantined has to quarantine for 14 days. Um, The DPH does um, recommend that any close contact gets a test. We They recommend that you get your test four to five days after the last day of contact because um, 50% of people um, will turn positive um, by day five of their um, exposure to the infected person. So if you get a test by day five and it's negative, it really decreases your chance that you're going to turn positive the rest of the time. You still have to quarantine because there is that chance that you can. Um, only 5% of the people um, become symptomatic between in the first um, 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours. So um, there is that little window that you have when you're deemed a contact. Um, let's see. But we can talk about testing a little bit. Um, PCR, that's the molecular test. That's really the gold standard and that what most physicians and um will refer you to if you become um, symptomatic. There's also the antigen test. You just wanna make sure that your insurance covers those things. Your insurance will cover a PCR test if you have a need to get one symptomatic, um, your close contact. So um, I I actually recommend just waiting and getting the PCR test. So um, quarantine guidelines. So when you're quarantined and you have to stay in for 14 days, this is like a simple chart. That's what it will look like. Even if you, So let's just say you live with someone who um, is a positive case, but you can separate from them and you can quarantine from yourself. This is kind of tricky. So let's just say your husband is positive. You have to separate from yourself. You need to make sure that you have your own bedroom. bedroom. Your husband's using his own bathroom. He's really staying away from you. Then your quarantine can start right then and you can quarantine for 14 days. Another example of being a contact, let's just say a coworker is positive. You're the contact. You go home, you quarantine for 14 days. It's a very simple quarantine. It's 14 days. Um, and you can, as long as you're asymptomatic, you're done with the quarantine on after the 14 days. The next slide shows how it gets a little tricky. If you, um, when I go back to the example that you live with someone and they're isolating, they have to isolate for 10 days. We could flip this around a little bit. Let's just say you're a parent 
and you're you're positive, so you have to isolate for ten days. And now your student, you really couldn't separate from your um, your young student who's like a kindergartner or a first grader. So your student's quarantine wouldn't start until after the end of that isolation. So your student would actually be out for the ten days of your isolation plus the 10, 14 days of his quarantine. So that would be, or her quarantine, that would be 24 days. So if you can separate from the infected person, the quarantine's pretty easy. And if not, then it's a conversation with the contact tracers and they can help you figure out when your, your last day is. Um, so testing results. What do you do while you're waiting for your test? The most important thing that you can ask yourself and just keep thinking, have you been in contact with anybody who has tested positive for COVID-19? If the answer for that is no, you just take a deep breath and you wait for your test results. You try to take care of yourself and you try to feel better and get plenty of rest. You should keep to your own room or space just in case that test comes back, back positive. And this is the same advice for if your child is testing. Try to keep your child to his own space just in case that test result become, comes back positive. Um, but your family members can go about their regular life, they can go to school and they can go to work. So that means if a sibling is home and is symptomatic and is getting tested, try to leave that sibling in his own space and the rest of the siblings can still come to school until the test comes back. That is per DPH and that is per DESI. The reason for that guidance is that um, currently in Mansfield, we have a, a really low um, positive test rate. So we're, we're currently below one. The la We've been following it every two weeks. We don't check it again until next Thursday. So we're on a, uh, you can look on the Mansfield, uh, the Massachusetts website and they check the positive um, rates weekly. We are doing it um, for our team that are following the numbers. We do it every two weeks. When we checked it last week, we were at a 0 0.5, I think 0 0.57, uh, 57, 0.57% 57 um, positive test rate. It might go up a little bit in the next week or two, but we're still way below 1%. So if you think about it that way, of all the tests that we're doing in Mansfield, and we know that we're over testing for every symptom, there's a good probability that your test is going to come back negative. So you just take a deep breath and you wait. And then if the test comes back positive, then we'll, we'll dial back and we will figure out what we have to do. Um, one thing to remember is right now um, we're all re-entering different types of groups that we weren't involved with before, like daycares or playing soccer or just doing different activities that we weren't. Yes, we've been socializing in small groups for the past couple of months, but with the same people. So now as we start to interact with other people, our immune systems are obviously going to react and we're going to see a lot of colds and viruses and fevers in children that hopefully won't be COVID. Another important thing to do is you just really stay home while you're waiting for your test results. Even though I'm saying there's a good chance it is most likely negative, we don't take that chance. You stay home so you're not out and about in case it does come back positive. Um, so contact tracing. This is going to be a huge part of um, the Nurses' Day this year. Um, we all took an online course um, through Johns Hopkins to be certified in contact tracing. We also helped the town with contact tracing in the spring when the pandemic first started. Um, as we go back to school at, during the end of spring into the summer, the um, collaborative, the community tracing collaborative took over the contact calls. So now as we go back to school, we're working to form kind of a team with the community um, tracing collaborative and we're going to work with them to do some tracing. So I've had some webinars. We have a team leader assigned to our school and we have our own team of contact tracers for the town. Um, and when we get cases, especially if we're aware of them in the school systems before they are, the school nurses are going to start the contacts and try to and get the information out as quickly as possible. Um, because just by the virtue of way the process works, sometimes there's a delay between the time you take the test, the time the test gets lagged, the time the physician finds out, the time you find out, and the time it's logged into the computer program that the community collaborative tracers work. So there's a pretty good chance that the school will find out before the collaborative tracers and we can be in touch with them and we can start um, letting people know that they need to quarantine so they don't come into school. Um, this is what school nurses have always done for like measles and chicken pox when we have breakthrough cases in the school. I mean, usually we're talking maybe one a year in the whole school system. So we're definitely going to be doing it on a much larger um, level, but um, we have experience in it. And um, the community tracing team is very collaborative and I think it will be a, um, a good team to work together. So the next slide just kind of touches upon confidentiality. 
um, this is a huge thing. So when the nurses are calling you and we're contact tracing, please know that this is confidential. This is private. We really, um, that's an important piece for us. We want to protect everybody's confidentiality. We don't want anyone to feel embarrassed or ashamed or um, this is a virus. It's very easy to get. Anybody can get it. And I think right now, as we're, everybody's going back to school and going back to think, nobody wants to get sick. And we just have to be really careful that we understand that anyone can get this virus and it really doesn't matter who has it or what that person's name is. What matters is that we do all the right steps after that. Um, so when we call you, please understand that we will take that information and do what we need to do, but we will not share your name or anything else when we're contacting people. Um, it's really important to be honest when we call you and to give us a, um, an accurate list of the things and events that you've been doing. Um, sometimes it's hard to remember who you've been in contact with and you know, there'll be open communication because you might hang up the phone and think, oh, you know, this. I also did this because we're talking 48 hours prior to when you started to fail sick. Um, the next slide is just um, just let you know that the once we make the initial contact, then we're going to put all the information into the um, computer system. The, it's called Maven that the state uses for tracking, and then they'll continue with the process. So what you'll see on your phone are the um, prefix 833 or 857 and ma um, MA COVID team should flash up. So just so you don't think it's a crank call, if you ever get these numbers and you're not sure who it is, you can call the public health um, agent and she can confirm that for you. And when they call you the second time, they're going to ask you a lot of the same questions that we've asked you, but you would be surprised that, like I said, sometimes your memory will, will be jogged and you'll think of something else. The other thing that they'll also offer is support services. Um, they'll, they'll make sure, I mean, we will um, also ask you if you have the ability to get food um, and that sort of thing, but they'll um, have a lot of assistance that they can offer you and some assistance for childcare as well. Um, the next slide is just a flow sheet that we're using in the schools and we tried to cover um, all the categories that I'm talking about. There's a category, this is just, really the DPH and CDC recommendations for these individuals, individual who's had close contact with COVID-19, um, no matter what they do, they have to quarantine for 14 days unless they turn positive and then they have to isolate on top of that for the 10 days, wherever that starts. An individual who's positive for COVID-19, they need to isolate for 10 days. Um, Sometimes you have individuals who have no symptoms, they're asymptomatic, but they tested for a certain reason um, and it turns positive, they have to isolate for 10 days. We don't know when that started, but we isolate them for the, for the following 10 days. Um, the next column is kind of what I was talking about when we send a student home sick. There might be students who have pre-existing conditions or get diagnosed with something else. And as time goes on, the tolerance for testing might change. So if they have a doctor's note with another diagnosis, they can return to school as long as they have um, their temperature has decreased. And then the next column is um, information about travel. So on the next slide, Diane, if you can just um, click the next slide, um, is information about the travel order. So this is the mass travel order from the governor. We are just following um, what the mandate is, which is basically trying to restrict people who are traveling back from red states. So when you go onto this website, you'll see all this has changed. It just changed today. We just updated the picture. So right now there's a lot of red states. A week ago, there was less red states. Um, if you um, travel to any of these states and you return, you need to fill out a travel health form, which is on this website. And um, if you need to get a test when you return from that state. So if your child is 10 or under, there's an attestation that you can fill out on this um, travel form that states um, that you don't, if you don't want to test your child, it just states that they do not have COVID symptoms and they were not in contact with anybody with COVID symptoms. If that's your choice to do that, that's fine. But your student can't return until we see a copy of the, the parent or guardian's um, negative PCR. Um, which they have to get to return to this state anyway. So if you travel with your child during the school year, you need to um, submit the negative PCR to the nurses before they can return to school. Um, the next slide just touches upon the flu immunization mandate that came out this year. So students that are in preschool and kindergarten to grade 12, whether they're hybrid or remote, 
or um, yeah, just hybrid or remote, they need to get a flu vaccine by December 31st. Um, exemptions, medical and religious exemptions are allowed. There's a website on the form. Um, and we are actually having a flu clinic tonight. So um, you're probably not there, but we have one more flu clinic on October 15th. CVS is doing it for us. You can sign up online. They opened the slots to double the slots because um, it was full for the first one. It's very easy with this time slot. You're in and out within 15 minutes. Um, so I really recommend that you use that flu clinic or you go to your pediatrician or just go to any CVS um, if you're nine or older and you can get a flu shot. If you're under nine, you have to get the um, flu vaccine through your pediatrician. Um, the next slide just talks about some modifications that are happening in the health office just due to COVID regulations that have come down to us through DPH. So all screenings have been waived for this school year. We really want to give students as much time in the classroom as we can while when we're in the building. So there won't be vision and hearing screenings um, this year, postural or the SBIRT screening in the middle school and the high school. If for any reason you're worried about your child's vision or hearing during the school year, please contact your school nurse and they can set up a neutral location and at least screen your child just to give you some baseline information to go to the eye doctor with um, or uh, the pediatrician. Also for children with asthma, um, per DPH and CDC guidance, um, nebulizers are not going to be allowed in the school just because of the aerosolation procedure. So, um, we'll work around it, and when children are sick with respiratory symptoms and they need to come back, we'll make a plan with the parents, and um, we'll make sure that they're safe to come back, and, um, and we can still use nebulizers in the, in the health office. I just think that's important to, to note. Um, if you click to the next slide, um, this is just a page that has all the health services, the school nurses' contact information, their phone number, their email, and even their fax number if you want to fax your flu vaccine information. Um, please call them with any information or email them with any information you have. Um, and Okay, so yes, we've seen some questions come through the um, chat line and we're going to post a, a, a FAQ on the Returning to Learning website at the end of this presentation and we'll run by next week, by Tuesday and we'll handle all the questions that come up, whether it's about, um, oh, okay. Um, whether it's about um, health services, food services, or um, buses. So I am going to wrap up because I think I've taken up a lot of time and Ed is just dying to talk about buses, right? Yeah. It's here. Okay. Okay, good evening. My name is uh, Ed Donahue. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations. One of my areas of responsibility is, is uh, student transportation. So I just wanted to just give an overall, uh, you know, obviously transportation this year will be very different that, you know, as we start the school year and the hybrid model and transporting a bulk of the students on uh, four days a week. Uh, obviously, I just want to go overview of our, of our all the procedures and our safety protocols. And obviously our focus is to safely transport all the students all students on a daily basis as needed, and also the safety, obviously the drivers who are, who are, who are driving the driving our students back and forth. Uh, we have been transporting students already this year. We, uh, Rolling Green has been open since uh, mid-September, the last few weeks that's been open. We've been transporting students uh, on a regular basis to Rolling Green. Also, we have some daily cohort students who have been in the school since uh, mid-September, last few weeks. So we have about three buses we've been running on a daily, on a, on a four day a week basis with no, with very safely, with no issues to date. Uh, so we're, we're, so as we expand the model, I, I, we, we feel we have some procedures in place. I just wanna go over those. Everybody knows, knows what to expect when we start, you know, the hybrid model next uh, Thursday, October 15th. As you know, let's go with the schedule. So obviously, you know, if your student is is in, in cohort A, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be transported if they take, if they're, if you're electing to take the bus, they'll be coming in on Mondays and Thursdays. Cohort B will be attending school on Tuesdays and Fridays. As I mentioned, we have some daily cohort students and they attend school all four days of the, of the week. All right, the, the bus routes uh, this year, I mean, generally our bus routes are very, uh, very similar from year to year. We, we will be adjusting the routes this year as we're, as we're still working on the routes as we speak. Uh, and getting all you know all the registrations was, were closed last week for bus transportation, so we we have to work on 
on adjusting some of the routes to, to maintain the limited capacities. The capacity of a bus for this year with the, with the new guidelines would be 23 students maximum. That's on one, one seat, well, one student per seat on the bus. Uh, we'll have, I'll have a slide a little later showing how we're gonna sit on the bus. But if students or siblings are living in the same household, they can sit together. So the, so the total number of students on a bus could get higher depending on family situation. We could get up to, like, I suppose, up to maybe 30 students on a bus, depending on, on, the, on the siblings or, or, or students who live in the same household. Uh, the daily cohorts, uh, the people have been, the students have been transported in the daily cohorts. The most likely those those routes will change because we haven't we haven't been transporting that many students in. So those parents must be be aware that to look for the new routes uh, that will be coming out in the next in the next few days. And they're also we, we, in the past. Uh, some people may live in neighborhoods where there's multiple buses that go through that neighborhood. Uh, and maybe if you missed one bus, you grab go to the next corner and grab the next bus. Well, going forward this year, we're not gonna, that really wouldn't be allowed. We're going to have to notify people of which of families of which bus they have to take going forward on a regular basis because we will be having students will have assigned seats, so we have to make sure they're on the right bus. So if, if there is an interest, any instance we do contact tracing, which uh, which uh, Christine doing spoke about, we need to know who's on a bus each on a daily basis. So there will be rosters, and the bus drivers will be will be tracking who's on a bus and they'll have assigned seats. The next thing, as I mentioned, is that the seating capacity is limited on the buses. So we try to do our best to maintain social distancing on the buses. They said drivers will have rosters for each student. They'll be assigned a seat. We probably want to assign the seats till after we get a few days into this, you know, probably three or four days once, you know, of the transportation until we establish the routes. We may have to adjust some routes uh, as we, as we, as we go forward, we may have to adjust the, the start of the routes and the pickup times. Our goal is not to have the buses when, when we, the students arrive at school, we don't want the buses to be sitting too long in the parking lot and having the students waiting to disembark the bus. So, our, so we may eventually, you know, you may get some notice after a few days of school, well, you, the start time of the bus is gonna go a little bit later so we don't have the students sitting on the bus. The goal is not to have students sitting on the bus you know, for more than five to 10 minutes at the most, or more like five, you know, waiting to get off the bus when they arrive to school. So we, we will be working, we'll be able to fine tune those times. So please, you know, be a, be patient if you do get your bus time does get changed after a few days, we're gonna work our best to, to safely get ready to school on a daily basis. Uh, they said students, same household can, may sit together on, on the bus. It's probably, actually, it's probably recommended. Um, also, is it all the schools? You'll get more details from each school, but all the schools will have, will have multiple entrances open during for the arrival and dismissal in order to keep students as socially distant as possible on a daily basis. So we will be working when we get to the schools to, to not on, like especially in the middle of the high school. We have 29 buses on a daily basis, so we'd obviously we, we're not going to be on load 29 buses simultaneously. So we are working the schools working on procedures to safely have the students exit the bus on a daily basis and get into into the school safely and do our best to maintain all the social distancing and making sure everybody has their mask at all times. And they said this slide will show you, you know, how we, the students will be sitting on the bus. Each bus seat is numbered. There's a number above the, you know, above the seat, above, I think it's above the window, they have the numbers. So the first seat behind the driver is they recommend that, that seat to be remain empty. And then you'll see as we stagger, each to the back of the bus, in the first in the first seat, the student sits against the window and, the, and obviously the seat behind is sits on the aisle. And as you can see, it's staggered. So as we go through the bus and that would do our best to maintain social distancing. So you know, we, we, students will have assigned seats, as I said, on the bus. That that's something is different. And that's, we're gonna have our best to have, you know, to work with the bus company and the drivers to maintain that uh, on a daily basis. Okay, and we do ask, you know, with social distancing at the bus stops and students and parents waiting at the bus stop to wear their mask and do the best of social distance while at the bus stop. I, you know, depending where the stop is, you may not be able to maintain six feet if it's a small area, but we want people to do their best with socially distance and everybody should be hopefully wearing their mask while they're waiting for the bus, you know, in the morning, you know, to get on the bus. And student must, students must wear their mask 
for duration of the bus ride and in the part once they depart when they're getting off the bus departing the bus and walking into schools are important for everybody to be wearing their mask uh the drivers will have mat the all, all the all the buses will have uh mask available for students either we have, we have some juvenile you know pediatric masks for the younger students or, or adult masks for the older students they will have them available on the bus if a student forgets their mask or they or their mask breaks you know that there'll be a mask available for anybody on the bus and there also will be hand sanitizer available on the buses it'll be right i think it's pretty much right behind the driver so if a student wants to hand sanitize their hands as they walk on or off the bus is sanitizer available on all the buses another thing we're, we're focusing on obviously as i mentioned about not having the buses sitting at the school you know idle for students uh, to wait to get in the bus, wait to get in the school. That's really due to ventilation. We, re we really wanna keep the buses moving or the windows open. So all the bus windows or a hatch may be open, will be open at all times when the bus is operating, especially obviously in the good weather. So as long as possible, we'll keep try to keep the windows open until we get obviously to the very cold weather where we can't keep the windows open, but that'll be a focus. I think you'll see when the buses start pull up into the air, I think all the bus, all the windows should be open to ventilate the bus as much as possible when we're transporting the students to school. And our bus contract, we have a number of years, Conley, uh, Michael Conley bus, uh, they are committed to cleaning all the buses. We have a we have an arrangement or agreement with them, you know, to maintain, they're still obviously selling the state guidelines. So twice a day, they will be misting or, or spraying a strain agent over the, over the whole bus, you know, pretty much fogging up the whole bus. They will be doing that twice a day they'll do that in the morning after they've done all the morning runs just so you know most of our most of the buses do three do a three we call a three-tier system so they do the middle high school students and they do the jordan jackson students and the robinson students so once they've completed their robinson runs they go back to their bus yard they will spray they'll spray the bus entirely to, to clean clean the bus they'll also do the same at the end of the day in the afternoon when they return to the bus yard they'll spray them entirely spray all the surfaces of the bus with their with this spraying the agent they spray you've probably seen that a lot on, on different things yeah you may have seen it we have we have some of those but we're getting some more of those in the schools you may have seen those a lot on they're very common in all areas of, for you know clean gyms and things like that to clean them in addition the bus drivers will have a spray and wipe they will spray and wipe the touch points throughout the day hope they'll, they'll be doing that but they can do that between the runs where they can spray the handrails spray the spray the uh the, the tops of the seats where the students will be touching as they go walk up and down the aisles. So they will, they'll be spraying those between the runs when they have time. They have a few minutes between the different runs they do in the morning and the afternoon. They'll be doing our best. I mean, most of our bus drivers actually are, are probably town residents. So obviously they're very focused on trying to, to keep the buses as clean you know, as possible for our students. And it's a Conley bus is committed to cl these cleaning protocols that are recommended by DESE, which is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So we do feel we have a great partner in Conley to keep the buses clean for our students and, our, and, and, you know, and for the drivers too. We also have, do a lot of, like, a lot of the transportation we do for uh, Rolling Green is our, is our uh, special education buses. Uh, so we have, you see our, a suite of uh, small buses or mini buses and we have some vans. We, the schools follow the same protocols. Uh, to, to, uh, of you know of limited capacity and, and cleanliness, so we we use all the same protocols inter you know internally with our own staff. There may be some questions. If you have any questions, you can email them to me. Either I'll get back to you, or our key person is our, our transportation coordinator is uh, Mrs. Debbie Fullerton. So she on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you you can actually email transportation at mansfieldschools.com. You can email me directly or I'll have her contact you, or if you need me, I can get involved. Or she, on a day-to-day -day basis, Mrs. Fullerton will be answering the questions, okay? Oops. And right now, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, our food service director, uh, Don Langtree, who will talk about what to expect for food services as we return to school next week. Thank you, good night. Hi, my name is Don Langtree, and I'm the food service director for the schools. And just want to talk a little bit about um, what's going to happen with food service this year. So a little bit of information. The USDA waiver that was put in place um, was to address a lot of food insecurity that's happening because of the pandemic and all the financial fallout from 
from that type of um, difficulties and, and hardships that, that, that were created. Um, what it does is it allows us to offer breakfast and lunch free to all students. And that includes both the in-person students and the remote learners. So it'll, it covers the bag lunches and the grab and go lunches that were breakfast and lunches that we're providing. Um, but we'll get to that in, in just a few more slides. We do still wanna encourage everyone to fill out the free and reduced forms. There are a couple of reasons for that. Um, unfortunately, at this point, the waiver is still, whoop, let me go back one. The waiver is still um, on a temporary basis that it's only in effect until December. They are really trying to get that to go farther, but at this point in time, it's only through December. Um, so the other option or the other thing with the food service, the free and reduced forms, is it allows us to keep you on the list of free and reduced students. And when they do another round of the pandemic EBT cards, which are an, uh, an additional assistance that's available, your name will automatically be included in that list and it'll be sent to um, the sent for assistance and you'll get an EBT card that would be give you more funds available for breakfast and lunch. Um, if you move to the next slide. So a little bit about the meal food service that's gonna happen. And it's really our goal to try and keep things as, I say normal as possible or what the kids are used to. Obviously things are gonna look a little bit different, but all the meals will still meet the USDA guidelines for the different age groups through the schools. Um, the menus will be posted on the website. I apologize, they're not up there yet, but they will be up soon. Um, as the students come into the serving lines, they will talk to the server and the server will actually put the tray together for them. So the students won't be able to uh, take their sides or, or pick up their milk or anything like that. We'll actually build a tray and give it to the students at that point. All the food items will be wrapped and covered. Um, so they won't be able to really touch anything. Um, they will still have a choice of entree, like I said, as posted on the menus. And they'll also have a choice of milk. We will only be doing white milk at breakfast, uh, the 1% white milk. Um, but they at lunch they will still have a choice and the other part of lunch for the fruit sides and the vegetable sides again they'll tell the server what they'd like um, it's going to come on the tray and the student can either accept it or refuse it at that point before it gets to the student so they'll have some choices um, it's going to be a little bit more limited than we're used to especially to get started um, and then for the a la carte items we really won't be offering a la carte at the moment. Uh, we're going to wait. Hopefully the second full week of service, we'll understand and, and know what's how things are going to are, are playing out um, and how timing is going to work and getting the kids through the lines. Um, you know, all the kids will be spread out. So it, it makes things a little bit, a little bit more difficult and we've got to really make sure that we can get them through fast enough so they have time. Um, okay, next. The safety precautions, some of the things we've had in place. The first picture on the slide, that's actually the high school serving line with the new plexiglass dividers. Um, we also have the barcode readers. We're going to be getting the students uh, barcodes that they will use for our scanners at the registers. So there'll be a touchless system there. The cashiers will be wearing shields and masks. It can make it a little bit difficult, so we need some patience and we need people to speak up if they're trying to, to talk to us um, and speak, try to speak as clearly as you can with a mask on because masks will be worn in the serving area by everyone, students, staff, doesn't matter. Everybody has to have a mask on at that point. Um, the only time the students are actually allowed to take the mask off or when they're seated for lunch. If they have to get up from their seat at lunch at any point, they have to put the mask back on. Um, we have social distancing is in place. There's signage on the walls. There are stickers on the floors. So it trying to keep the, the students at six foot um, intervals. Um, and there'll be a lot of reminders and, and things like that as the kids come through the line. At the younger levels, the um, uh, monitors will be helping out and you know a real group effort is to keep the kids distance and as safe as possible. Um, next slide. So this is the grab and go meals. Um, actually, the picture up on the right is what a four day breakfast bag looks like, because that's what we've been doing right now. But we will be transitioning to the hybrid um, session grab and go meals, and that will start on Wednesday of next week. It's October 14th. So 
basically you'll be given five meals in a bag. So you'll have a breakfast bag with five meals, a lunch bag with five meals, and then also the milks and the juice to go with that. Those will be in, um, in a plastic bag because they tend to be wet. Um, so we're going to start that and pickup time has changed a little bit. That will be from three to 4 PM. And also the location has changed. We actually have a little bit more permanent spot. We're going to be working out of door number 18, which is behind the high school. So just make sure that you follow the signs on the, the directional arrows on the, on the ground when you're driving through the parking lot, you know, stay to the bleachers and then come around to the back of the school. Um, it's, it's hopefully a better spot for us. So it'll keep us out of the weather and, and keep everybody dry and warm because the weather's going to change and we'll be doing this for a while. So we're kind of really happy to have a new site. Um, if you could please, please, please let us know if you're coming. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult, just it's an open site. So, you know, we appreciate the, the support that we get. If you could tell us that you're going to be there, um, once you've signed up or once you've let us know that you're coming, your student will be included in the count. Then at that point, you just have to know, let us know when you're not coming. That way we can prepare the right amount. So we're not, um, we're not losing food and everybody that shows up gets, gets what they need. Um, cause we really want to help out, help out the community. Um, and I think, let's see, that's actually about all I have. So Christine, I don't know if you're still out there. Come on. <laughs> um, Surprise, come back. <laughs> I am. Why am I not? Okay. Here I am. Um, so this last slide is just our contact information. Uh, my email, Ed's email and Don's email. So we have the questions from the chat and we're going to put together some answers on a FAQ. We'll post that on Tuesday. We really appreciate you tuning in for this information. Um, and I just want to thank the community for their support and getting the schools back to hybrid and just try to continue to do um, all the right things so we can continue to move forward. Just a little plug for hand washing and mask wearing and social distancing. So um, <laughs> thank you very much and um, have a good night. Is there any last words from Ed or Don? Nope. I, I thank everybody for their time and I appreciate that you're tuning in to listen. And if you have questions, by all means, we're always here. Yep, definitely. No, thank you very much. I, I, I just like people, it's, it's very, you know, it's gonna be a difficult trend, you know, time year for all of us, you know, students, staff, uh, you know, all the stakeholders. We just ask people to be patient as we adjust and may have to correct some things and to get the best practice. To be safe for everybody and, and so that's our goal so we ask so yeah. maybe you know we may make some changes or things might so we want people to be patient understanding we're doing our best for everybody to keep as safe as possible at school for all all, all our staff and, and students thank you very that's much that's that's, that's so that's true ed and it's going to be an evolving situation so some of the practices that we're talking about now they could change a little as time goes on and really patience on every side is really important so um that's something that that I learn every day. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, have, a, have a good night. Good night. Good night.